I'm Erik Svensson and this is Ibrim and uh, we work in a development team uh, here in Stockholm for the company Asolvi and the base question we asked and for this presentation is can you use Elixir at the Microsoft shop? So uh, at Asolvi we, we deliver service operation software for uh, uh, roughly 800 customers in Europe, and it's uh, mostly on-premise installations on uh, Windows Server. And we're using Microsoft SQL Server databases, and we're using Microsoft Azure as our DevOps platform, and we basically develop on Windows for Windows. And uh, yeah, most of this development is done in C-Sharp and .NET, and we have around 30 developers in uh, six or so teams, and uh, I guess we've been experiencing that uh, it's a bit slow getting new uh, features out, and uh, that the uh, .NET ecosystem is very large. So uh, uh, yeah, it, it kind of has a tendency to kind of create knowledge silos between the teams and so. So we've been looking into finding uh, uh, other options for for getting stuff out faster and uh, start looking at functional languages because it might better model the reality of our uh, customer domains. And we started looking at Elixir specifically because we want this like high capacity and everything that the uh, Elixir uh, O2P platform promises. So, and it also, in our experience, has a, like, a limited set of keywords, which kind of limits the developer a little bit in the things you can do and choose from, so we kind of don't end up in the, these very long discussions on which pattern to use, which frame, uh, which libraries to use, and so on. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the backstory on how we got to do an experiment. So this is uh, uh, basically what it looks like. We have these uh, monoliths that uh, we deliver to our customers and. Uh, some of them are built on like VB6 and other leg legacy languages, and uh, we we got uh, the opportunity to take one uh, core feature and try to re-implement it as Elixir microservices. And we did this as an experiment with the help of Erlang Solutions this fall, so we're fairly new to this. And uh, uh, yeah, and the goal is that this should be deployable on Windows Server or in Azure as app services. And uh, we don't want any uh, downtime, like break the service for our customers. So we kind of need to do this gradually and talk to the same Microsoft SQL Server database as, uh, uh, as the monolith is currently using. So that kind of poses a few challenges. Like first of the, uh, the overall challenge of working with Elixir and finding information and resources for Elixir uh, together with uh, Microsoft uh, products. And uh, like how to talk to SQL Server and so on. We will not cover that in in this talk, the SQL Server part. But we have gained some knowledge there as well, which we'll try to share as we go. Uh, and uh, yeah, and another challenge for us, or uh, after we successfully completed this experiment, has been to kind of spread Elixir within the organization, try to uh, teach uh, the other development departments uh, to, or development teams to learn Elixir and uh, uh, yeah, and actually start using it. So, and this talk will focus on, uh, on our DevOps pipeline, our CI and CD. Uh, so this is kind of what we have to play with. We have Azure DevOps where you can set up your uh, CI pipelines and, uh, and yeah, it's basically where you store your uh, Git repositories, and uh, uh, yeah, so that's what we have. And then we have Azure, where you can deploy app services and app services and uh, host virtual machines and so on. And then we have the on-premise part of our delivery chain that we also need support. So, how can we use Elixir here? Like we could try to hand roll our build scripts uh, in the CI pi pipeline to kind of make it work with uh, uh, building Elixir and yeah, doing a lot of custom things. But what we fi found was uh, very helpful and uh, uh, kind of cut, uh, cut some corners in every arrow you see here in this picture is uh, using Docker. So basically uh, Docker is 
yeah, lets you contain your uh, application and your dependencies in a container. And then you can uh, package these containers as images and then you can kind of pull them uh, from the on-premise uh, installations or you can deploy the containers uh, directly to uh, Azure as an app service. And uh, it's not really a virtual machine, it shares the, uh, the kernel with the operating system and uh, uh, yeah, but it's a lightweight, nice way of packaging. And we're also using it in uh, in the CI pipeline, where we kind of simplify that whole thing by just using the multi-stage uh, Docker file to build and push the image. And then we're using the Azure Container Registry, a private container registry, to uh, to publish the, the, the image. And then uh, for continuous deployment, like the app service will reload automatically whenever a new image is pushed with the same tag. And uh, for the continuous delivery part to uh, to the on-premise customers, um, yeah, they can download the latest version of that image. So uh, at the core of this, we have the Docker file, uh, which is kind of a recep recipe for uh, for yeah the container, what it should contain. And uh, Ibrahim will talk a little bit about uh, the contents of our Docker file and how we structure it. All right. So here on the left side, we have our Docker file now that we use to build and uh, package our Elixir applications. And I'll start going through this Docker file to talk about more how we structure it and why we structure it this way. But before doing that, let's talk uh, a little bit about what we want to achieve with that. So what we want to achieve first is to build and deploy anywhere. So basically, now we are deploying on Azure. Tomorrow we want to deploy in AWS or we want to deploy on on-prem. It won't matter. We want to do that with the minimum effort possible. And we also want to spend less building time because, as you know, build time translates to time and cost. Uh, some of the uh, build pipelines will charge you on the build minutes and if they don't, they will charge you on the parallel jobs, which if you if your build takes like 30 minutes, you will find the need to have more parallel jobs, so more cost. And also we want to verify that our code changes should be integrated. Like we want to make sure, for instance, that our tests are passing or we don't have any warnings or code smells in our code. We want to automate that as much as possible. And last but not least, we want to run a lightweight Docker container in production. We don't want everything to go on our production image. And we will go through every part of this. <coughs> so, here is part of our Docker, um, Docker file. And I'll talk about setting up the build stage. So I'll highlight this part here. So here in that part we have, we start with from Elixir Alpine. And Elixir Alpine is an official image based on Alpine and it contains all the build tools that we need to build our Elixir. So we use this one. And then we start by setting some of our build arguments and environment variables as you see here with arg and env. Uh, and we just install some build tools that we need like hex and repar. So, all right. And then we talked about that we don't want to spend a lot of time waiting for the build to get completed. So there are some tasks that we have that actually takes a lot of time and more likely to have the same output for a sequence of builds. Like, for instance, fetching our packages or third-party libraries. It's unlikely to change unless we like update those dependencies. But most likely what you will fetch in like sequence of builds will be the same. And also we have a static code analysis we use, and I'll talk a little bit about that one. Uh, but this static code analysis needs to build like a PLT files for the third party libraries. And in our case, it takes 15 minutes to build that. However, if we can cache that, we can use it for a sequence of builds until we update our dependencies. So, how can we achieve like how can we cache those? Docker caching handles this for us. So, and how Docker caches stuff? So if we start by 
writing some code here in Dockerfile. So we have some commands like from, arc, copy, etc., etc. Each of these commands translates to a layer in our Docker image. So every one of these is an image. So if we start ha having a view of those, uh, of those uh, layers, it will be like a stack. We have our base image and then every command built up upon it. So if you make like a small code change to our code base without updating any dependency or anything like that, we will end up by having just the parts that have changed updated. Not all the layers will be rebuilt. And how we done that, if you notice here, like I've taken a little snippet from the code before, but here we first copy mix EXS and mix lock only. We don't copy all of our code base. And Docker will only invalidate the layer cache if the files it has have changed or the run command itself have changed. And since here we have mix EXS and mix lock and we haven't updated any dependencies, so those files haven't changed. And the run command, we haven't changed it, it still do the same thing. So these layers will be cached and will be reused for a sequence of builds. All right, and now we start by building our solution. First of all, we copy our files, like here copy dot dot, means like copy all what you have here in the working directory to the Docker image. And afterwards, we will check if our code is formatted using mix format, check formatted, because we, we decided that we want the code to be integrated if it was formatted. And then we compile with warning as errors. We don't want any warnings to come to our, uh, to be integrated. And we run the, stack, the static code analysis. And the static code analysis is basically some kind of uh, hunting mistakes or code smells in our code. So basically we want to make sure that our code will be correct as possible. And then we run our unit tests and then we package a release. All right, so now in this state, we are kind of ready to deploy our application. We have made the release and everything. But really, do we need all the files that we have now in our Docker image? Like now we have our code, we have third-party libraries, BLT files, all of these stuff we really don't need as much. So what we ended up doing is that we use a two layers, uh, sorry, a two stages Docker file. And what I mean by stage is that it starts from scratch, like here, from Albine. When you use from, it starts up a new stage. It will not take all the files from the previous stages unless you specify that. We have here like copy, if you notice, copy from build, which is the previous stage, copy just the release. So we will get only our release binaries here and that's all we need to deploy. So we'll end up by having a lightweight image that we will just publish to our Azure application. All right. And how the Azure pipeline will look like. The build pipeline in Azure now, since we are using Docker, we are doing everything in Docker file. So it will be as simple as possible. So here we just have two steps. One of them is building an image, and the other one is just pushing the image to our container registry hosted in Azure. And the YAML code will look like this. Yep, we just have to use the build and pushing the image if it went successful. Yep. And uh, that's all for the talk. You can find the code and the guides to how to implement uh, the solution we have presented and also how to publish uh, your application in Docker you, in our uh, medium. And also there's some more articles that you can read about, oops, someone turned off the screen. Yeah, all right, here it is. And some also, some other articles to use Elixir with SQL Server and the challenges we have had. Hope that you enjoyed the presentation. Ready for questions. Did you have any, um Political challenges um, start with getting this started. Uh, there has been resistance from uh, from 
yes, some developers, uh, but uh, political, not so much, I would say. Our CTO has been very encouraging in doing this, and uh, it's, uh, yeah. So, yeah, resistance, but maybe not political challenges. Are the developers or the developer that resisted still there? Yes, yes, of course. It's not, we're not forcing this uh, in the organization. It's merely like our job, I guess, is to be kind of evangelists within the, the company. And uh, in the end, the teams need to make their choice. I was wondering if there's anything else you guys would want to do to improve it even more. Is there anything else you're thinking of in the future? Yep. I guess uh, some parts of the PLT caching. So right now it's uh, being cached on the agent that currently runs uh, the build. And uh, that works as long as we're like using the same agents. And uh, uh, we feel like we could util utilize a hosted agent in Azure, if that makes sense. I guess other CI pipelines also have agents. Uh, I'm kind of into the Azure ver world right now. But... Uh, uh, yeah, so some type of other solution for the PLT caching would be interested. Now, like when it jumps from one agent to another between builds, sometimes you have to uh, do the caching and wait 15 to 20 minutes, which, yeah, we want speedy builds. Is there anything you find, like, for example, table storage connection or something where functionally you're, like, it works, but you feel like you're missing out on something by going to Elixir? Basically, like if you're writing .NET C Sharp applications with the whole Azure ecosystem, you have everything kind of laid out for you, right? I want to add a step to run my tests and publish the test results in a neat formatted way, like there's a step for that. But uh, when uh, when doing this with uh, Elixir, you're kind of uh, on, you, on your own in f terms of support. So yeah, you are missing out on, uh, on some nice to have 